During World War II, this site was one of many POW camps on United States soil, Camp Ruston. Between 1943 and 1946, Camp Ruston held over 4,000 German prisoners of war. Included were the elite North Africa Corps, Luftwaffe, and the captured crew from two U-boat submarines. This is their story, told in detail for the first time in over 60 years. At the outbreak of the war in Europe on August 31st, 1939, with a massive and quick attack known as the Blitzkrieg against Poland, Germany's fury began to sweep across Europe. In June 1940, Hitler turned his sights against England. In a response known as the Lind-Lease Act of 1940, the United States government began supplying Great Britain weapons of war, not troops, to help defend England against Germany's Third Reich. The German government consequently discounted diplomatic relations with the U.S. and declared war against the United States that same year. By mid-1942, the United States was fully involved in the war. 1943. Virtually all of Europe is under the control of Germany's Nazi regime. Seeking world domination, Hitler moves forces into North Africa, where Field Marshal Erwin Rommel scores early victories. Ascending to a British plan to retake North Africa as a prelude to the invasion of the European mainland, the Allies under the command of General Montgomery attack Rommel's elite North Africa Corps at El Alamein in the country of Tunisia. Despite the Germans' combat experience and Rommel's military genius, dwindling supplies and troops ultimately led to victory for Allied forces and the capture of hundreds of thousands of German and Italian soldiers. The war was brought close to home for many Americans by the establishment of prisoner of war camps across the United States. The capture of several hundred thousand German troops complicated an already critical shortage of prison space in England. Britain urged the United States to take on the burden, and the War Department reluctantly agreed. An extensive building campaign resulted in POW camps in 46 of the 48 states. They would eventually hold nearly 400,000 POWs, or PWs as they were called then. After capture, all prisoners entered the United States through points of embarkation in New York and Virginia. From these points, POWs were processed and distributed to one of the main camps or smaller branch camps. Most camps were located in the south or southwest, far from critical war industries. The POW camps were generally segregated by branch of service, rank, or political affiliation. POWs identified as hardcore Nazis were held separately from other populations. Camp Clinton, Mississippi held nearly 40 generals and three admirals during the war. Officers and enlisted men were divided into separate compounds. Some camps contained predominantly Africa Corps, Luftwaffe, Army, or Naval personnel. Most of the camps were designated as extensions of existing military bases. But in Louisiana, after scouting locations in several parishes, a site outside of a small North Louisiana town was chosen for a new internment facility, Camp Ruston. Ruston had contributed its share of young men to the armed services, some leaving family and farm for the first time. Blue Star banners adorned windows and victory gardens filled backyards. The local college, Louisiana Tech, was the site of a Navy V-12 program for training young naval and marine officers. Patriotic fervor was high. Perhaps the most visible change to the community was the erection of the POW camp in a frenzy of construction. 
extended over 750 acres. The camp was built in accordance with layout plans which had been standardized by the Department of War. Since the camp was literally carved out of the piney woods, a complete water and sewer system had to be laid. Three wells were dug to provide water and a large water tower was constructed. The first inhabitants of Camp Ruston were not enemy prisoners, but American women. Due to the initial slow influx of captured soldiers, the facility first served as a basic training base for the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, or WAAC. The camp was provided under the condition that Corps members would move out on 30 days notice if needed for POWs. In April 1943, the first 500 recruits arrived at Camp Ruston to form the 42nd Women's Army Auxiliary Corps Regiment. In many aspects, the training was similar to that received by combat soldiers. The basic training course included infantry drill, physical training, military customs and courtesies, defense against chemical attack, and regulations. Days were filled with a detailed schedule of drills, calisthenics, and classes. Some recruits received specialized training in motor transport to become drivers of jeeps and trucks and make minor repairs to military vehicles. Although the training operation was large, it was short-lived. In three and a half months, over 2,000 WAAC recruits received basic training. By July, the WACs were gone with prisoners on the way. On August 14, 1943, 300 enlisted men from Rommel's Elite Africa Corps arrived to become Camp Ruston's first internees. Germans? Coming to Ruston? That's absurd. They're our enemy. I do have grandchildren, you know. I think I'll write Mr. Roosevelt and give him a piece of my mind. The flow of prisoners continued and by October reached a peak population of 4,315 men, including 181 officers, all of whom were Africa Corps veterans. Over the next two years, troops from other army units and the Luftwaffe would be added. The camp's three original compounds grew full, resulting in the addition of a fourth compound for officers only in the far northwest section of the camp. The camp brought together the most remarkable mixture of nationalities ever assembled in one place in the history of the state of Louisiana. Major. Major, do you speak English? Yeah, Lieutenant. All we want is the name and rank of each man. We don't need any other information. Do you understand? Yeah, Lieutenant. While Germans made up most of the prisoner complement, many nationalities were represented. Italians, Poles, Thanks, Russians, Thanks, Yugoslavians, Thanks. Spaniards, Hungarians, Czechs, Vichy French, Austrians, Dutch, Danish, and Mongolians. Even American nationals were found among the prisoner population. 
To many POWs, the camp was a life of near luxury. One Luftwaffe fighter pilot said, It was a tough camp, but by the German standards, it was still like a vacation. We had good food, just the standard issue American food as prescribed by the Geneva Convention. The professional cooks that we had among the prisoners made an excellent dinner out of it. End quote. It was definitely a nicer billet than the scorching heat of the North Africa desert or the chilling winters of Europe. Sports and physical activity were serious pastimes among the prisoners. A large athletic field permitted soccer, the camp's most popular sport. Sports allowed interaction between the camp's captives and its guards. These activities indicated an amical, if not congenial, relationship between the prisoners and their captors. Academic pursuits were also popular among the prisoners. American staff and qualified prisoners taught classes that included chemistry, geography, literature, mathematics, and political theory. Some of the prisoners passed the time creating intricate crafts. In front of many barracks were miniature models created of rocks, cement, and mud. In front of one building in the Africa Corps compound was a mock-up of a sports complex about 10 feet square. Not all the prisoners at Camp Ruston were career soldiers. Many were professionals who found themselves in the military in a time of war. Their ranks included professional painters and other artisans, musicians, physicians, and university professors. Music was an important aspect of camp life. The prisoners had their own orchestra. Radio station KWKH in Shreveport even broadcast a musical production of the Ruston POWs consisting of a medley of waltzes, foxtrots, and jazz songs. By practicing their trades at Camp Ruston, these citizen soldiers helped their fellow inmates through the tedious days behind the barbed wire, half a world from home. But prison camp life was not a complete life of leisure. Chores around the compound were mandatory. The camp was kept immaculately clean with some attempts at landscaping. Enlisted prisoners worked in maintenance shops, the guards' mess hall, the hospital, and laundry. Many prisoners were loaned out to local farmers cutting timber and tending crops. The POWs found picking cotton to be brutal work. Work details were frequently sent out to other government facilities such as Barksdale Army Airfield. Stories abound about the sense of camaraderie that apparently existed between some guards and prisoners. Each compound of the camp was serviced by a canteen where prisoners could buy toiletries and other items. Could buy a beer 14 cents. Uh, a carton of cigarettes was two dollars in those days. And I would make, if I worked, $27 a month, we were a pretty rich guy. Now an officer, a lieutenant, started off with $25 per mule over the Red Cross, you know. And uh, I would only get three books. But if I worked every day for eight hours of work picking cotton or something, you get 80 cents. A staff of prisoners supervised by the camp's post-exchange officer operated the canteens. Among the most commonly sold items were pens, pencils, notebooks, magazines, newspapers, paperback books, tobacco products, and playing cards. Until mid-1945, a number of food and refreshment items were available for purchase by the prisoners. In the mess halls, prisoners ate as well as their keepers, possibly even better since the prisoners at Ruston had some excellent cooks among their numbers. Some foodstuffs in short supply among the kitchen populace could be found in the camp's kitchens. Across the nation, however, public pressure was brought to alter prisoner meals so that they did not appear to be serving their time in luxury accommodations. In May 1945, the Provost Marshal General Supervisor of all POW camps restricted foods available to prisoners and prohibited further sale of candy, cookies, beer, and soft drinks. Movies were shown regularly to the prisoners, but no motion picture had the impact of film of the German concentration camps, gas chambers, and mass graves. One night when the POWs gathered for a monthly movie, dozens of armed MPs crowded into the room. 
Then the Holocaust films were shown. The POWs were visibly shaken by the images, staring in disbelief that their government would commit such atrocities. It was one thing to kill in battle, another to be a murderer. The story of Camp Ruston is intertwined with mystery and military secrets. One of the most closely guarded secrets of World War II was the capture of U-505. The U-505 was captured off the west coast of Africa on June 4, 1944, by the U.S. Navy. Led by the USS Guadalcanal, American warships launched an intensive depth charge attack that forced the U-505 to surface. As the U-boat surfaced, American destroyers and aircraft raked it with machine gun fire. One U-505 sailor was killed and several wounded. The captain gave the order to abandon U-505 and to scuttle her to prevent the U-boat's capture. Only the very front of the boat and the top of the conning tower was still above the water. A boarding party closed in before the U-505 could slide below the surface. In a feat of expert seamanship by a crew of mostly teenagers, the U-505 was rescued from a watery grave. The submarine became the first man of war captured on the high seas by the U.S. Navy since 1815. 58 prisoners had been taken from the water during the action. One man had been killed and three wounded, including the 505's commanding officer. The U-boat was secretly hidden in Bermuda, and the crew was interrogated in Norfolk, Virginia, where they received black POW uniforms. Later, they were taken under heavy security to a railroad train. The windows were nailed shut during the two-day trip to Ruston. The guards on the trip were unique. A U.S. Navy baseball team was pressed into service to guard the prisoners. Learning the story of my father's involvement with Camp Ruston really changed my life forever. Um, he was a baseball prodigy. In 1940, he was recruited and signed by the Brooklyn Dodgers at, at 15 years old. Uh, sent off to uh, one of their feeder system farm teams and uh, to be developed. Uh, he was moving up, developing nicely. But in 1941, with the bombing of Pearl Harbor, it changed his life along with the uh, lives of an entire nation. He was placed on a touring baseball team, similar to what the USO would be today. It was sent to North Africa, playing on the United States Navy North Africa touring baseball team. He spent most of the war there playing with his teammates. It wasn't really like being in the Navy as such. He was there to play baseball. But as the war started moving on to the European continent and away from North Africa, they sent the baseball team home. Uh, they didn't know what to do with them. They had thought about sending them back through basic training because they'd really never had basic training. And one night, in the middle of the night, while in Norfolk, Virginia, they're awakened from the sleep by the shore patrol, uh, taken to a Quonset hut where they're forced to sign some documents swearing them to secrecy. Once the documents were signed, they were told that the United States Navy had captured a German U-boat that the prisoners were being held there at Norfolk, Virginia for processing, and that they were going to be transferred to a remote camp in northern Louisiana. And the United States Navy baseball team would be in charge of guarding them. After a while, they became bored and just watching the prisoners watch them. And my father got the idea that maybe they should be let out of the pen and play baseball, you know, be taught to play baseball. The 505 crew slipped into Camp Ruston sometime in July 1944. The sailors had no clue where they were and no idea they were so far from the sea. Employees and guards at the camp were sworn to secrecy and couldn't tell anyone about their presence. All the nurses and all the military people were sworn to secrecy with the punishment of a court-martial and execution. If anybody ever would 
one, let one word out that the whole submarine crew was here. And I, being the trusty of the captain, I could walk outside the fence. I never knew that there was a submarine crew here. There was good reason for the secrecy. Although the seizure of an enemy vessel was a major accomplishment, the true value in the capture of the U-505 lay in the discovery of an Enigma code machine and codes used by the German Navy to communicate. If Germany knew the U-505 had been captured, the codes would be changed. When the International Red Cross visited Camp Ruston, it was refused admittance into the U-505 compound. On at least three occasions, the Red Cross inspectors were turned away from the sailors' compound. Eventually, there would be less time for soccer and baseball for the U-505 as the end of the war drew near and the need for secrecy faded. The sailors were assigned to work crews around Ruston, sawing timber and picking cotton like the other POWs. Life as a U-boat submariner during World War II was an indescribable adventure. The fear, the dangers, and the very nature of life underwater required strength of character and nerve beyond comprehension. Horst Blumenberg was the only member of the U-664 crew to be sent to Camp Ruston. In August 1943, Blumenberg's sub was caught on the surface and attacked by U.S. Navy planes. The crew jumped into the Atlantic before their doomed U-boat slid under the water for the last time. The American aircraft did their best to rescue survivors by dropping rafts and life vests and calling ships to the scene. Eight hours later, 44 survivors were taken to Casablanca and eventually found their way to Fort Meade, Maryland, and later Fort Hunt, Virginia, for interrogations. You have to uh, remember if you are in a situation where you are a crew member uh, of a submarine, you do not know if you are alive the next morning. Uh, it was a relatively uh, dangerous on, uh, undertaking because, let's say, if you sunk a, a tanker and, uh, uh, along the uh, ship lines on the American coast or out in the Atlantic on the convoy, you would have a pretty bad feeling about the people which would be uh, floating in burning oil. But you have, uh, you train your brain not to think about it because Tomorrow morning, the same thing can happen to you. Although the internees of Camp Ruston were well treated and did not want for necessities or even conveniences, prisoners in a time of war are expected to attempt to escape their captors. The only U boat sailor known to have escaped Camp Ruston was Horst Blumenberg of U 664. During his imprisonment in various Allied camps during the war, Blumenberg escaped several times for short periods. To Blumenberg, the thrill of the escape, even for a short respite outside the wire, was worth any punishment the authorities could impose. On May 2, 1945, General Jodl, Chief of Operations in the German High Command and his staff, entered Allied headquarters. There, the terms of unconditional surrender were signed. On May 8, 1945, the world celebrated VE Day, the day when the world was free of the dangers of the Nazis. On February 3, 1946, the last prisoner of war left, and the camp was officially closed in June 1946. Over time, the buildings came down. For soldiers, prisoners, and local citizens, association with Camp Ruston was an unforgettable experience that molded their future attitudes towards their fellow man. 
Like most World War II POW camps in the United States, little remains today to mark the ground once inhabited by thousands of soldiers and sailors. Only two dilapidated buildings remain near Ruston, but the rough outline of the compounds can still be seen. Okay, okay, you need to turn the bat around. Turn it, turn it around. Hit the ball there, the bat'll crack. Not like you probably know what I'm talking about anyway. like that, and then you're gonna throw it down there to him. Beiden Schatten sahen wie einer aus, dass wir so lieb und hatten, das sah man gleich darauf. Alle Leute sollen sehen, wir bei der Laterne stehen, wie einst Lili Marlene. Schon rief der Posten, sie blieben Zapfenstreich, es kann drei Tage kosten. Kamerad, ich komm so gleich. Da sagten sie auf Wiedersehen. Wie gerne möchte ich mit dir gehen. Mit dir, Lili Marlene. Mit dir, Lili Marlene. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org.